Hey folks, I'm JC from One Shot Adventures, and today I'm going to review the Dungeon Crawl Classics adventure, Tomb of the Savage Kings, and I'm going to give you Game Masters a few tips on how to run it like a pro. The Dungeon Crawl Classics RPG has some of my favorite adventures in its library. They all seem to be these fast-paced, savagely dangerous, and really tightly focused adventures. I've also found that they're really easy to prepare. This last weekend, I needed an adventure, and I needed it fast, and so I grabbed Tomb of the Savage Kings. I really liked its cover. I have a thing for mummies. And I was actually able to prepare this adventure in the morning and have it ready to go by lunchtime. That's pretty cool. Anyway, before I dive into my review of Tomb of the Savage Kings, I want to warn you that there are spoilers ahead. So if you're thinking about playing in this adventure, you better stop watching now, or else your eyes shall feed the maggots, moon sand will fill your lungs, and the scorpion shall know your bed. The Tomb of the Savage Kings is a short, 12-page adventure that can easily be completed in just one session. The entire adventure takes place inside this ancient pyramid. If you're a fan of ancient Egyptian themes, you're going to want to check this adventure out because there's a lot of nods to old mummy movies in here. The adventure is designed for level 2 characters, but because there's not a lot of combat encounters inside this pyramid, it's actually really easy to tweak to your own PC's power level. The setup of the adventure is this. The PCs are approached by a young widow named Zita Zaztor, who desperately needs their expert help. Apparently, her naive younger sister Isabel got entangled with this devilish assassin named Ardith Bay. Wait, 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 wait. Isn't Ardith Bay the exact name of the character from the Mummy movie? That's exactly his name. That's what I thought. According to Zita, Ardith Bay found a map to a long lost tomb and he persuaded Isabel to go with them to the tomb to find this ancient magical spear that was apparently hidden there. It's kind of like one of those adrenaline-filled zipline dates that you see in those bad reality TV dating shows, but this time it's in a cursed 5,000-year-old evil temple. Zita hasn't heard from her sister in days, so of course she assumes that she's trapped inside this temple with her new boyfriend. So Zita wants the PCs to go to the temple and rescue Isabel. Zita is even willing to send her trusty manservant, Wimble the Halfling, who is going to help the PCs with the rescue. Now I think this is a pretty good setup for a fantasy adventure. The goal is made clear up front, and there's a little bit of mystery to the setup, which is going to hook the PCs in. But in an interesting twist, this entire setup is a lie. Zita and Wemple the Halfling are the actual members of a secret assassin's guild. They broke into this tomb to find that spear themselves, and they accidentally awakened an all-powerful crazy mummy who followed them back to town. While ransacking Zita's house, the mummy saw her sister Isabel and fell in love, as mummies are to do, and dragged her back to the temple to force the spirit of his long-lost girlfriend into her body, as mummies are to do. Now just having had their butts kicked by this crazy angry mummy, Zita and Wemble have no desire to go back to the tomb themselves. So instead, they make up this story about this fictitious Ardith Bay, and instead ask the PCs to go rescue Isabel instead. Okay, let's just stop here for a second to talk about this twist. I actually like that the author tried to include some misdirection here, but I do think it has some logic problems. Sure, Zeta and Wemble are actually these secret assassins, but couldn't they have actually just told the PCs the truth about what happened? They could say, hey, we went into this tomb to look for this treasure, and we got way over our heads, and we woke up this ancient mummy and almost got it killed, and he followed us back to our house, and he captured Isabel. So, of course, if they explain it like that, needing a band of skilled expert warriors to go rescue Isabel actually makes perfect sense. It's a great reason to go get hired help. So I'm not actually sure why they had to hide this whole thing and make up a story about Ardith Bay, especially since their lie is going to fall apart pretty quick. After all, if the PCs do rescue Isabel, she's going to be like, Ardith, what, my boyfriend, what? So honestly, first I was going to tell you, just ignore this twist or go with the real story because it doesn't really affect the adventure at all. 
But the more I thought about it, the more I thought there is something here. And it all comes down to Wemble the halfling. Because here's a halfling who seems to be innocent and is actually an assassin going into a tomb with the PCs. So I thought, what if Wemble the halfling had a reason to betray the PCs and try to kill them inside the temple? What if he was the one that convinced Zeta, let's not tell these guys the real story, but let's make something up to put me in a better position with them. Because he wants to be alone with the PCs to screw them over in the worst possible way inside the mummy's tomb. So the trick here is give Wemble the halfling a personal motivation for why he wants to hurt the PCs. In my game, this was actually pretty easy. My players have a longtime enemy, this assassin named Ichabod the Ripper. He's shown up and he messes with the players every few adventures. So I figured when Ichabod the Ripper heard this whole story about this mummy and Isabel's capture, he thought this was a perfect opportunity to mess with the PCs again. So he paid off his buddy, Wemble the Halfling, and told them, go into the tomb with the PCs and then betray them at the last minute. So this means during most of the adventure, Wemble the Halfling acts as a good-natured, mostly useless companion. But then, in the final encounter, he reveals himself as a traitor. The temple is actually filled with lots of traps and ambush opportunities and even a powerful magic scroll, so there's lots of tools for Wemble to try to kill the PCs with and then run away laughing. Oh, I think I know how to translate that scroll. Just hand it to me and turn your backs around and keep on exploring and I'll figure it out. This slight change to the story makes this twist feel really personal to the PCs. Just connect Wemble with them based on something else that happened in a previous adventure. Okay, let's move on. The PCs and Wemble the Halfling head out to this pyramid. Once they get to the pyramid, they'll find that it's sealed up pretty good. There's no obvious entrance. There's this narrow shaft at the top that a halfling or some greased up thief can shimmy down. The PCs also find a baboon statue with hieroglyphics on it, which can be read to get a clue that if moonlight hits the statue, the temple will open up. So whether the PCs figure out this riddle or they shimmy down that vent, players get to use some creativity here. I actually like it when adventures offer the opportunity for player ingenuity to solve some problems, not just use what's on their character sheets in the form of abilities and skills. So I thought giving the players a few options to figure out their way inside the pyramid was actually a pretty cool start. Now, once the PCs are inside the pyramid, they're gonna discover that there's a lot of clues and history written in these ancient hieroglyphics. Wizards are gonna have to use their read languages spell to really figure out what's going on. Now, I didn't love this, and honestly, my group's only wizard really only has fire spells, so I made another small change to the adventure here. I said that Wemple the Halfling was an expert on this ancient long dead language, which made sense since I figured that he and Zeta had been studying this pyramid for years, and they had been there before. So I figured if he poses as sort of the historian, then it makes sense why he came with them. And making Wemble the PC's only reliable translator means that your players are going to try to keep him alive. And I would play him as this cowardly sissy for most of the adventure. He tries to be helpful, but then he panics and he runs into bad areas and leads the PCs into danger. And inevitably your players are going to try to chase after him to keep him alive. Giving Wemble this skill set adds a lot of texture to the rest of the adventure as the PCs explore the pyramid. The interior of the pyramid is small, it's about nine rooms total, and they're an equal mix of traps and monster encounters, and there's some history and puzzles to discover as well. Now, I'm going to complain about something here, and I feel like I always complain about this with Dungeon Crawl Classics adventures, but the adventure map is this beautifully illustrated isometric thing, which means that it's Sometimes hard to figure out where stuff really is, and it's zero help for game masters who want to run this adventure over virtual tabletop. So I actually had to build my own virtual tabletop map for this adventure. I didn't spend too much time on it, but it served its purpose, and if you want it, you can download it for free in the description below. I think if you add a few lighting effects in Foundry or some other VTT tool, it actually looks pretty good. The traps inside the pyramid are about what you'd expect in a mummy's tomb. Mostly deadfalls and simple things like that. Nothing a good thief can't handle. Ah, trap disarmed. You'd think this tomb would have had real traps, but they didn't prepare for me. But let's talk about the combat encounters where I think this adventure really shines. 
For example, one of the first combats the PCs stumble across is a pack of undead baboons. I love these guys. I mean, what can be more fun for a game master to do than to try to kill his friends with a pack of undead monkeys? Plus, I had them running up the walls and, and hopping around the PCs and dropping down on them. It really made for a chaotic, fun encounter. And plus, for some reason, I don't know why, whenever I have dangerous monkeys in my games, they like never miss their to hit rolls. And so whenever my players see that there's monkeys in the adventure, they kind of freak out. I hope that you have this experience as well. But as much as I love these undead baboons, I am not going to give them my coveted Monster of the Month award. I'd really like to, but I just can't. And that's because there's an even better monster inside this tomb. In the burial chamber of Karis, he's the adventurer's big bad mummy, the PCs find a puddle of disgusting, foul-smelling yellow mummy juice. Puddles of mummy juice just really unnerved my players when they saw it. But what freaked them out even more was when the puddle formed into an honest-to-goodness mummy juice elemental. That's right, this adventure features an elemental made out of mummy fluids. It scared the crap out of my players, and they never back off from anything, but when this thing formed up in front of them, it just sent them running. So Mummy Juice Elemental, congratulations. You've just won the Moist Monster of the Month award. This pyramid tour ends when the PCs find Karis the Mummy. He is hidden behind a secret door in a separate room, ready to perform a dark ceremony where he transfers his old girlfriend's soul into the body of Isabel. Now, a word of caution here. Like I said, Karis the Mummy is hidden in a room behind a secret door. Now, if I have one complaint about this adventure is that it's not super clear how to get to him. The map doesn't really even show you that there's a secret door separating him and the rest of the pyramid. So if you're not careful and you're moving fast, your PCs can actually just stumble on him like right away in the adventure. And you have to read a few sections of the adventure to really understand that he's behind this secret door and that the PCs need to find it in a mosaic and they need to shout the mummy's name for it to open up. The mummy's name is written on a sarcophagus in another room along with a clue that that's what you need to do. It's not that the adventure doesn't tell you all of this, it does. I just wish it was super clear up front. And it's possible for the PCs to miss this entirely. If the PCs don't discover the secret door, they're out of luck and they'll never rescue Isabel. And worse, there's another part of the pyramid map that just ends in a dead end with a glowing green emerald embedded in it. It looks like that should be the entrance to the final boss room, but really it's kind of a red herring. So that'll confuse players too. So the fix for this is actually pretty easy. I made sure that when the PCs entered the antechamber where the secret door was, they heard evil chanting coming deep within the walls. So the PCs knew that they were close to Karis the mummy, and that caused them to double their efforts to find that secret door. And then because I used Wemble the Halfling as the group's expert translator, I had him around to make sure to emphasize the mummy's name when they found it. And then he was always there to help them through that puzzle just in case they needed it, just so they wouldn't miss the final boss. So the final fight takes place inside a large chamber with a pool in its middle. This pool is actually a portal into the past, 5,000 years into the past when Karis was a mere mortal and still had his original girlfriend around. Karis is draining the life out of Isabel so that he can summon that girlfriend's soul from the past, as mummies are to do. Now Karis the mummy is pretty tough. He can absorb five points of damage per hit, he can fling some charm spells, and he's strong enough to pick up players and chuck them through that portal, sending them 5,000 years in the past. Oh, and there's also a demon jackal that can leap through the portal if his ritual gets messed up somehow. It's going to be a tough boss battle, and especially because this temple is pretty small, if they haven't taken care of some of the other foes, like that mummy juice elemental, it's going to get tougher. Or if the GM decides to use Wemple the Assassin to strike at the moment that they finally meet Karis, that adds a lot of chaos and difficulty to this final encounter as well. But what kind of GM would do that? Now you're going to want to think about this portal before you get to the end of this adventure. The adventure is very clear that Karis' preferred attack is to chuck PCs into the portal, which is a one-way ticket to a totally different campaign world. Now, as a GM, I think you have to think about whether or not this is a trip that you want to really offer. 
My PCs are in the middle of a big campaign. I really didn't want to send them off into a brand new one. And I wasn't sure what to do if one of them got sent through the portal because that could separate your party and really mess with your campaign plans. I think game masters have a few options here. One, you could just say the portal's instant death for any mere mortal who falls through. Or you could say that anybody who goes through has to face off against that demon jackal before they can return to the present. Or you could just embrace it, and if there's one good thing, Dungeon Crawl Classics offers an adventure that is designed to send players back forward in time. Now, fortunately, or maybe unfortunately, this really didn't come up in my game. Karis the Mummy fumbled a few attacks, and the PCs took him down with lots of critical hits. He was not the mummy I hoped him to be. But I think if one of my players had gotten tossed through, I just would have said he got lost in time, and if he passed a fortitude save or something like that, he managed to survive for many years and become a great and ancient king. At least if your character's gonna die in Dungeon Crawl Classics, that's the way for him to do it. But with some good tactics, the PCs can defeat Karis the Mummy, rescue Isabel, and return back to civilization. So other than that one issue with the isometric map, and a little lack of clarity about how the boss is hidden away, I love this adventure. It's exactly what it wants to be, a fast-paced, Egyptian-themed tomb stocked with not just some of the things players expect, but also lots of surprises. And I also like how this adventure gives the GM some extra flexibility. Yeah, there's those NPCs with motives and twists up front, and you can always add a backstabber in there, but the pyramid even includes an additional room that's hidden away that GMs can customize themselves. So if you want to add a treasure chamber or some new mystery that's there, it's there for you to do it. Now, I will stop here to say I'm a little biased. I love anything that has to do with ancient Egypt. A year or two ago, I actually scoured the hobby looking for some good Egyptian-themed mummy adventures for my players, and I was actually surprised there's not too many of them. I think even Call of Cthulhu only has two adventures in that style. So to make up for the gap, I actually ended up writing my own adventure. It's the 1930s pulp adventure, The Curse of Sekhmet, which you can download for free at oneshotadventures.com. It's my own homage to the old mummy movies and Indiana Jones adventures, but if you have a favorite mummy adventure, let me know in the comments below because I might have missed it. If you've played in or ran Tomb of the Savage Kings, let me know how it went. I hope these tips were useful to you. Also, if you enjoyed this video and want to see more like it, don't forget to like and subscribe. Until next time, I'm JC, and whatever you do, don't drink the mummy juice.